Tobacco use remains the leading preventable cause of death in the United States. And it affects individuals living with mental illnesses at a disproportionate level compared to those in the general population. My name is Zimo Coley, and I'm going to talk to you today about engaging people with mental illnesses and behavioral health challenges in tobacco treatment by using evidence-based practice and enhancing our evidence-based practice. I'm currently an associate professor at the University of Kentucky College of Nursing, and there I also direct the Behavioral Health and Wellness Environments for Living and Learning program, as well as I direct the Tobacco Treatment Services and Evidence-Based Practice at Eastern State Hospital in Lexington, which is a psychiatric facility. The goals of this presentation are to talk about tobacco dependence and persons with mental illnesses or substance use disorders in comparison to the general population. I'm also going to describe treatment options and considerations when providing tobacco dependence services to these populations. And particularly, I'll talk about how to adapt tobacco cessation treatments for those living with mental illnesses. So first, I want to start with some background. When we consider mental disorders in the United States, they are highly prevalent. About 18% of the general US population have a mental disorder, and about 4% of these suffer from a serious mental illness. It's important to remember that the DSM-5 has about 22 categories of what are designated as mental disorders. And I want to point out one in particular, which are the substance-related and addictive disorders. In other words, even tobacco use disorder is considered a mental disorder based on the DSM-5 criteria. When we look at the past year mental disorders in the United States, the most prevalent is the anxiety disorder. And we also have highly prevalent mood disorders, which are about 10% of the population. It's important to recognize these disorders because as we're gonna talk about in a few minutes, we're gonna see that people with mental disorders have this disproportionate use of tobacco. And there are relationships between tobacco use behaviors, particularly with those with mental disorders. But what about substance use disorders? As I mentioned previously, the DSM-5, which basically tells us about mental disorders and characterizes them, designates substance use disorder as a mental disorder. And when we think about substance use disorders, this is the use of any substance in larger amounts and at longer periods than were intended. We have this persistent desire and unsuccessful effort to cut down such substances, and people spend a great deal of time and activities, activities trying to obtain these substances or recover from them. One of the hallmarks is a specific craving to these substances, and this can disrupt, the use of these substances can disrupt a person's ability to fulfill major role obligations with their work, family, home, school life. And it can also potentially cause social or interpersonal problems. And some of the hallmarks of substance use disorders are that people develop a tolerance to these substances. And then if they're not using these substances at a specific time or when they try to abstain from them, they experience withdrawal. So again, it's important to recognize that tobacco use disorder is seen as one of these substance use disorders. Tobacco use is an interesting substance, uh, particularly nicotine, which is the addictive element of tobacco. In high doses, nicotine can fall under the class of stimulants, whereas in low doses, it falls under the class of depressants. This means that nicotine use, and particularly among tobacco users, really responds to your mood. So it's not unusual or uncommon to hear tobacco users say that they smoke when they're stressed or they smoke when they're bored. And they're using their tobacco product 
in different ways in order to ameliorate their specific mood states. And just as a quick review of the psychoactive effects of substances, when we're thinking about, I'll just point out the stimulants and depressants where nicotine falls under, stimulants cause this feeling of exhilaration, enhanced self-esteem, improved mental and physical performance, and even extended wakefulness. Some of the negative effects could be agitation and hostility, even causing panic. On the other hand, depressants help people to sleep, relieve anxiety, muscle spasm, and prevent seizures. The negative effects of these are that they can cause amnesia, reduce reaction time, and impaired mental function and judgment. And I want to point out these things because when individuals use tobacco, they are typically using them to affect mood states. So you will see that stimulant use, maybe when a person is a little bit um, bored or needs to improve their mental and physical performance. So you'll hear a lot of people living with mental illnesses saying that they use smoking or tobacco use to help concentrate or pay attention. And of course, on the other hand, we always hear many people saying that they feel stressed and anxious, possibly because of their mental illness, and smoking can help relieve those. And we'll talk a little bit more about these specific properties of tobacco use. In terms of co-occurring mental illnesses and substance use disorders, we know that there is a high correlation between the two. So when we look at data from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, we see that in the past year, individuals living with mental illnesses, any mental illnesses, are more likely to use substances of abuse as compared to people without mental illnesses. And this goes across all classes of substances of abuse. When we look particularly at alcohol, the rates are not that much different. But when we look at cigarette use, we can see that individuals who use uh, cigarettes and who have a mental illness are about twice the rate of those who do not have a mental illness. And based on these disproportionate rates, that's why we need to engage persons with substance use disorders and mental illnesses in tobacco treatment. But there are some specific reasons why we need to really consider this issue. And so I'm just going to show you a quick video to help enhance this um, understanding. For most of my life, I've struggled with anxiety and depression. As a kid, I didn't know what depression was. I didn't know what anxiety was. I just knew that I didn't feel the way that kids were supposed to feel. Smoking gave my brain this illusion that it was going to make things better, but really, it only made things worse. For people that live with mental illness, like I have, smoking's not an escape. It's a trap. Over the years, Big Tobacco has targeted a number of vulnerable groups in order to push cigarettes. But one group may be more vulnerable than most. Today, 40% of all the cigarettes smoked in America are by people with mental health or substance abuse issues. And I want to know why. Because this staggering statistic is far from coincidence. Tobacco, as a business, is a predator. This is big business feasting off our people, you know, individuals who are struggling with depression, struggling with anxiety, struggling with psychosis, struggling with other addictions, and feeding off them for profits. Dr. Jody Petraska is one of the country's foremost researchers on the dangerous intersection between smoking and mental health. What I found is that the tobacco industry has really promoted this idea of tobacco as medicine, this self-medication hypothesis, um, both through the research that they funded, as well as articles that they published. You have to wonder what the words scientific integrity mean to the tobacco industry. 
especially when you learn that Big Tobacco funded research attempting to highlight the so-called benefits of smoking. So this document is an example of the kind of work product that the industry would fund. And what's absent from here is, is recognition of the addiction. It's a psychological exploration of the psychic needs of man and how cigarettes are fulfilling these needs. Good Lord. They spend all that money, and I don't know why that is. There's no vitamins in this. There's no minerals in this. How does that make you feel about the tobacco industry at large? I feel like I'm being profited off of my issues. The culture of smoking within people with mental health conditions is so prevalent. Uh, I would say the culture has even infected our treatment programs and the way we deliver care. We have many patients who have had the experience of not smoking before rehab, going to rehab, and they pick it up. The first cigarette I ever smoked was inside of a psychiatric facility. Everyone smokes. You cannot escape it. Where are these cigarettes coming from? They're not falling from the sky. They're being manufactured. They're being sold. They were given to some treatment settings. Big Tobacco's attempts to push cigarettes on the mentally ill have taken on many forms. Perhaps none more shameless than the donation of free cigarettes to psych wards. There's a long history of smoking in these facilities. Patients would line up and light their cigarette on the wall. There'd be walls of smoke in the settings. You're sending someone to a rehab facility, but you're concerned about it because you know they may very well pick up this secondary addiction that could kill them. Yeah. But tobacco companies made it seem like you people are somehow different. That's not empathy, that's stigmatization. You got a 49. No. And it's a level of severe danger. In reality, it's more than stigmatization. It's exploitation to the tune of $37 billion a year. That's how much the tobacco industry makes off people living with mental illness or substance abuse issues. It's despicable that people take advantage of people's weaknesses. I know what it's like to come back from really dark places and to think that you have to have like the substance to rely on and you don't. I'm an addict. Tobacco companies, they want that because how are they gonna be rich without it? with every dollar I've ever spent on a pack of cigarettes. I probably could have paid off the house by now. But this community pays an even heavier price, one that can't be measured in money, because people with mental illness die on average five years earlier than those without. And many of those deaths are due not to their illness, but to diseases caused by smoking cigarettes. You see heart attacks, you see lung cancer, you see emphysema. So many of our patients will die from their tobacco use, not from their depression, not from their alcohol use, but from tobacco addiction. We are not just vulnerable, we are a valuable population. This is a group of people that it's still okay to discriminate against. And if you have to put that stigma somewhere else, here's a wonderful place to put it. Put it on big tobacco. I think that video is quite dramatic from the Truth Campaign, really highlighting the multifaceted issues that have promoted the use of tobacco among people living with mental illnesses and substance use disorders. And in 2013, the CDC began highlighting this issue they said that adults with mental illnesses are 70% more likely to smoke than adults with no mental illnesses. And from that time onwards, they're making a concerted effort to understand this discrepancy in terms of tobacco use rates, but also find ways to close the gap and even to develop treatments or accessibility to treatments for people living with mental illnesses. As an illustration of this issue, the gap between people living with mental illnesses and those without in terms of tobacco use, this graph shows us that within about a decade, rates of tobacco use among people with no psychological distress, these are the bottom um, bars, have declined 
from 24.1% in 1997 to about 18.2%. Whereas in the top bars or the top line, you can see that those rates among those with serious psychological distress or people with mental illnesses have not really changed that much. So this tells us two things potentially. One is that the programs, the evidence-based programs that we know that work in terms of reducing tobacco use and consumption seems to be working in a general population, but not in the populations that we care and treat. So it begs the question whether these interventions that we know work in the general population, are they not as effective for people with mental illnesses and substance use disorders? Or is it that they're just not reaching them? When we look at clinical groups, these are primarily hospitalized individuals. We see that these rates of tobacco use are much higher. So for example, the dark bar on the left, uh, SC is schizophrenia. People with schizophrenia, about 75% of them smoke cigarettes. When we look at the white bars, on the right, you can see that people with substance use disorders, they have the smoking rates about 80% or higher. So this is about two to three times the rates that we see in the general US population. When we think about the effects of smoking and tobacco use among people with mental illnesses and behavioral health challenges, as the video showed us, they die on average five to 10 years earlier than their counterparts. You know, some studies have actually said it's 10 to 25 years earlier. They have greater depression and anxiety. They have more substance use problems. They have more physical health problems, cardiovascular and cardiopulmonary problems. They're more likely to commit suicide and they have more sexual problems. This is in contrast to non-smokers with mental illnesses and substance use disorders who have much better health, live longer, need less medication, have less depression and anxiety, they save money. In other words, it's important to point out that tobacco use in these populations hinders their recovery. Okay, I'm gonna repeat that again. Tobacco use in this population is a great hindrance to their ability to recover. When we consider deaths among people living with mental illnesses, many studies have shown us that actually tobacco use seems to be the number one reason for these deaths, either direct tobacco use, indirect through secondhand smoke exposure, but they die not from their mental illness, but from primarily the diseases that are directly related to tobacco use. And that's why it is so important for us to address this issue. So why do people with mental illnesses and substance use disorders use tobacco? I'm going to show another quick video that will help us. We all know that smoking is bad and smoking is bad for everyone, obviously. But what's important to consider is that over the last decades, prevalence has fallen uh, consistently in the general population, now being around 21% in the UK. Um, a population in which it hasn't fallen at all is the people with uh, mental illness and particularly those with severe and enduring mental illnesses such as schizophrenia. Smoking rates in people with mental health issues can be double or even triple those in the general population. The more severe your mental illness, the higher uh, the prevalence of smoking and the more heavily dependent you are on smoking. Not only do people with mental illness smoke more frequently than others, but also they, they smoke more heavily. They are usually, um, they tend to be quite heavily addicted to tobacco for reasons that are not entirely understood. They are quite, quite complex. So there are neurobiological links, uh, there are um, environmental and psychosocial factors, and there are also genetic links. Research shows that the same proportion of people with mental health problems want to stop 
as those without mental health problems. So that's not the uh, inhibiting factor. It's more that people aren't being offered treatment at the same rates as uh, people without mental health problems. People aren't intervening as much. It's probably fair to say that the historic smoking culture that has been alive in mental health settings for for decades is still quite persistent. And that's despite the implementation of smoke-free policies that came into force in this country in 2008. In many mental health settings, although they're smoke-free in the buildings, they still have patios where people can go and smoke. Uh, and often opening of the patio uh, will be you know, a key event in the day of someone who's an inpatient, for example, and they can open the patio every hour and people will be then accompanied out to smoke. That uses an awful lot of staff time. So what we have to try to do is, is change that so that st staff's time is being used to help uh, promote the health of people with mental health problems rather than supporting their smoking. Sometimes we've come across cases where people have been actively discouraged to stop for um, reasons related to concerns that stopping smoking might exacerbate symptoms of mental illness or um, a certain protective attitude of staff towards their patients according to which they shouldn't run before before they can walk that that sort of thing don't worry about your smoking now you've got more important things to to look at or to worry about we know that People with mental health problems, the life ex their life expectancy is much uh, shorter than people without. So around 16 to 20 years in some cases, people will die earlier. One of the things we want to look at here is what proportion of that difference is explained by their smoking. What we do know is that for most people with mental health uh, problems, many of them will die because of their smoking rather than a result of their mental health illness. Nobody's suggesting that this is only the case because they smoke. But the fact is that death and, and disease related to cardiovascular illness and cancers are raised in people with mental illness. And those two, cardiovascular disease and cancers, are also linked to smoking. We have a moral duty to ensure that they're offered the same treatment as pe uh, people in the general population. Uh, otherwise, health inequalities will only increase for this group. So as demonstrated by the video, we can see that certainly there are several factors that affect or result in tobacco use among these populations. And I just want to talk about some of these factors more in terms of the theoretical concepts. So one of them is the model called the common factors model. And this says that the comorbidity due to shared risk factors across substance use disorders and mental illnesses are quite similar. The second model is what we call the secondary substance use disorder model. And it says that having a mental illness can increase the chance of developing a substance use disorder. The third is what we call the secondary psychiatric disorder model. And it's the reverse. It says that having a substance use disorder may increase the chance of developing a mental illness. And the fourth is called the bidirectional model, which says that having either a substance use or mental illness increases the risk for having the other. In the next few slides, I'm going to talk about some of the specific evidence uh, research that sort of helps us understand these different models. In terms of the common factor model, which says that there are common factors that predispose people to having substance use disorders or mental illnesses, genetic evidence suggests that there is shared familial transmission of substance use disorder, and there are some shared genetic effects between things like alcohol use and nicotine use. So even among substances, substance use disorders, there's some genetic shared effects. There are also some genetic shared effects between having a mental illness, like 
post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD or schizophrenia, and tobacco use. Another aspect of the common factor model talks about things like socioeconomic class, people who come from neighborhood disadvantage, who, have, who may have early exposure to substances, may also come from neighborhoods where there is early exposure to things like trauma, which can also lead to mental illnesses. And another aspect of this is illustrated by the video earlier, is that in the past, within substance use and mental health facilities, many clients and patients were actually encouraged to use tobacco as a way to socialize. Sometimes it was used as a token economy in order to ensure certain behaviors. Regardless, having these mental health or substance use facilities kind of engendered a, a social process which increased tobacco use. So it's not uncommon if you go to AA meetings during the breaks, almost everybody goes out to smoke. So we really need to address these issues by taking a specific look of, on how we consider the social normative aspect of tobacco use in these facilities and treatment programs. The secondary substance use disorder model, which says that having a mental illness will predispose somebody to actually using a substance, one of the most famous ideas is the self-medication hypothesis. Now, the self-medication hypothesis says that people use specific substances in order to ameliorate specific internal states of dysphoria. And again, the tobacco industry really promoted this uh, to make people think, well, if you're not feeling so great, use tobacco. That will help you feel better. So they promoted this in a lot of their marketing. But a more modern model states that it's the alleviation of dysphoria. People who have mental illnesses typically have these internal dysphoric, uncomfortable states. And they tend to experiment with several substances to see what's going to help relieve them. And they typically find that tobacco, being one of the most accessible substances, tends to help with some of these states. So some of the support for the secondary substance use disorder model, um, one a great example is how nicotine improves P50 gating and sensory overload. As an example of this, even as I'm speaking to you, you're paying attention to me. I can imagine that in your environment, there are several things going on. There might be birds chirping outside the window. You might hear cars outside or your kids may be running around. But because you're watching this video and you're paying attention to me, you're able to gate these distractions. Individuals with schizophrenia have a dysfunction in their ability to gate sensory input. However, when they're using nicotine through cigarettes, they will be able to gate. So in that sense, nicotine from cigarettes is functional. But don't forget that the 7,000 other chemicals in cigarettes will lead to disease and death. Another example of this is that we know there are some components in tobacco smoke. It's not specifically the nicotine. It's possibly the acetaldehyde. But that acts as a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, which can help to alleviate depressive symptoms. One more thing we do know is that nicotine itself, just by its nature, can act as an anxiolytic. So these are some of the examples of why people with mental illnesses may gravitate more towards tobacco use, specifically as a substance use disorder. An example of the secondary psychiatric disorder model, which says that when people use substances, it may cause them to have a mental illness, is this idea of behavioral sensitization, where the continuous stimulant administration can lead to increased sensitivity to the response. So in other words, if people start smoking at a young age, 
particularly when the brain is still quite vulnerable, it's creating new synapses, it's growing and developing, becoming dependent on nicotine and how that affects the brain may cause, okay, I'm going to repeat that, may actually cause mental disorder states. So some studies are linking early tobacco use to the development of depressive symptoms or early tobacco use to the development of psychotic symptoms in schizophrenia. So for an example, a study in Finland found that heavy smoking adolescents were three times more likely to develop psychosis than their non-smoking counterparts. The bi-directional model, which says that having a mental illness or substance use disorder can predispose to having either one, talks about this interactional effect between mental illnesses and substance use disorder in the sense that they reinforce each other. So having a substance use may trigger a mental illness in vulnerable populations, and this is then maintained by continued substance use especially through socially learned cognitive factors. So in other words, if a person who is um, anxious starts smoking, then when they smoke and the nicotine alleviates their ang anxiety symptoms, they may continue smoking because now they've learned anytime I, I feel anxious, I can use cigarettes to alleviate my anxiety symptoms. But what happens is that substance use, the nicotine, they start developing tolerance to it and even withdrawal. And so where at first they were using it for anxiety symptoms, because now they're developing tolerance and withdrawal to it, they're using larger amounts to get the same effect but slowly they shift from using it for the positive effect to now using nicotine or tobacco so that they're not going into withdrawal. So there's that shift from using it originally for a positive effect to now using it so that they don't experience the negative effect from it, the withdrawal. So I just want to talk about some of the myths that we encounter and how you address such myths about providing tobacco treatment for people living with mental illnesses. So one of the first myths is that these patients don't want to quit. But enough research has told us that those in substance use treatment, like methadone maintenance programs and alcohol abuse, endorse their desire to quit, up to 75 to 80 percent of them. Even a review study done in 2009 found that those with psychiatric disorders, at least 50% are contemplating cessation. In other words, we need to be diligent and faithful in asking our patients if they want to stop using tobacco. These patients are unable to quit, the second big myth. Well, the way you address this sort of myth is with the evidence. A really good meta-analysis of 19 studies performed by uh, Jody Prochaska found that individuals who were in substance use addiction treatment who quit smoking were able to maintain their quit. So yes, they are able to quit. Another study uh, by Cara Nocoli found that if you provide patients with evidence-based treatment, up to 40% of them are able to quit. The third big myth is these patients will relapse to other substances if they try to quit. This is primarily in relation to addiction recovery. But again, it's important to remember that smoking cessation actually improves mental health symptoms. And when people's mental health symptoms are improved, they're more likely to maintain abstinence. And another study talks about how Again, the Prochaska study shows that when people quit smoking, they actually maintained their sobriety from other substances. So it's important to have this research evidence in order to arm ourselves to address some of these myths that we will hear from our colleagues who are not as informed, as well as from our patients. 
So I'm going to show another video just to hone in these points a bit more. It's very well known how smoking affects physical health and that smoking cessation um, reduces the risk of developing physical diseases such as cancer or cardiovascular disease. But what's less well known is how smoking cessation affects mental health. Um, so that's what we set out to, to look at in this study and to, to see actually what happens to a person's mental health scores after they've, they've quit smoking. In order to answer this question, we did a comprehensive search of online databases to retrieve all studies that had looked at this question. So in particular, we wanted to include studies that had measured a change score. So they've measured mental health at baseline and then mental health after quitting and compared that to people who'd continued to smoke. We looked into each of these studies and we looked at their outcomes and we categorised the outcomes according to what the measures were designed to assess. Um, so these were things like anxiety, depression, positive affect. Um, and what we found consistently across the board uh, was an association between stopping smoking and improvement in these mental health outcomes. And this consistently favoured the quit group. Um, and to sort of interpret uh, the effect estimates, um, from these outcomes, we compared, compared them to antidepressant treatment for um, anxiety and depression. Uh, and what we found is that our effect estimates were actually equal or greater to that of antidepressant treatment for, for mood disorders. So it's quite fascinating. Um, one way you could look at it is that actually people felt better and then this prompted them to stop smoking. Um, but actually, that, that's not likely to be true. And this is because most of the studies we included were secondary analyses of randomized control trials of cessation treatments. So in these trials, um, most people tried to stop smoking. So whatever happened to their mental health happened after they stopped smoking. We also know that actually our patients do want to give up smoking in line with the rest of the population. Some patients will say to us, oh, well, it helps calm their nerves. But this research shows quite clearly that that simply isn't the case. In fact, when people give up smoking, actually their mental health improves. What we need to think about is how we can raise awareness in mental health professionals. How can we help our patients give up smoking? What are the things that we can actually do? We know there are smoking cessation clinics that we can signpost patients to. Perhaps we should learn how to give very brief advice. Perhaps we should also be prescribing stop smoking medications. And also I think there's a, possibly an attitude among mental health professionals that we think Perhaps we shouldn't stop our patients smoking because we'd be depriving them of one of their pleasures. But again, there's no real evidence that this is the case at all. One of the things that we often find when we talk to patients is they'll say, I need to smoke because of my stress doctor and, and uh, it improves my mental health. And it's one of those things that I think we've always found hard to argue with. Well, what we can say now is that it's those episodes of not having smoked for a while that give you that feeling of being moody and irritable and a little bit down in the dumps and anxious that is caused by smoking. And when you stop smoking and have stayed stopped for a while, those episodes will disappear and overall your mental health will improve. So I hope these results will give GPs new confidence that uh, they can tackle smoking in those people who find smoking uh, such a crutch for their mental health. In fact, probably the opposite is true. So it's important to address our responsibilities. And based on the clinical practice guidelines on so treating tobacco use and dependence, all smokers with psychiatric disorders, including substance use disorders, should be offered tobacco dependence treatment. And we clinicians need to overcome our reluctance to treat this population. Treating tobacco dependence in individuals with psychiatric disorders is made more complex by the potential for multiple psychiatric disorders and multiple psychiatric medications. So it is our responsibility to address tobacco treatment in these populations. It is part of the mental health treatment. So I'm gonna talk about some recommendations 
for tobacco treatment based on evidence among individuals with mental illnesses and substance use disorders. These recommendations will address using particular screening tools, considering the timing of treatment, types of treatment to be used, and also the duration of treatment. When we're considering some of the screenings for depression in smokers, we have to understand that people with mental illnesses, especially when they engage in tobacco cessation, they are at risk for higher nicotine withdrawal symptoms, and one of them is depression. So we don't want to exacerbate an existing depressive state. So for that, we want to screen for depression. And we can screen using the PHQ-2 screening tool, uh, which is just quick and use two questions. During the past month, have you often been bothered by little interest or pleasure in doing things, uh, feeling down, depressed, or hopeless? And these are based on yes, no. If they um, respond no, then their screening is negative. We don't have to proceed. But if they do uh, respond yes to either one, then we need to perhaps use the full PHQ-9 questionnaire. And we're mostly familiar with these as mental health providers. Other alternative screenings that we could use are the Zung Depression Scale or the Beck Depression Inventory. Now, these are usually longer, and that's why most people prefer the PHQ-9 in practice. We should also consider, because we know there's a high comorbidity between mental illness and substance use disorder, we need to figure out if they're also using substances. So we can use the CAGE questionnaire, which asks about um, four questions, very simple, to figure out how dependent or how severe their substance use is. If they score two or greater by responding yes to two questions, then there is a clinical significant substance use potential disorder. When we think about the timing of treatment, for those with mental illness, we want to delay treatment until their symptoms are in remission. For example, we can set a quit date in the future at a further time. We can also refer them for treatments, for their mental illness treatment uh, with a physician or a provider. And we need to be aware that they are at increased risk for suicide, especially when going through smoking cessation because of that withdrawal symptom of depressed mood. So especially for those who have a depressive, underlying depressive order, disorder, we need to monitor for their suicide risk, particularly using things like the PHQ-9 or other suicide screeners. We also need to monitor for their mental illness symptoms. Again, nicotine withdrawal mimics a lot of mental illness symptoms, sort of poor concentration, increased anxiety, um, weight gain, weight loss, insomnia, depressed mood. So sometimes patients, when they start in their process of quitting smoking, they'll say, I feel worse. And we need to educate them. Well, your symptoms are probably due to nicotine withdrawal, and we can manage those symptoms, but they need to be in constant communication with us so that we know how to address that. When we think about individuals with substance use disorders, when we're thinking about their timing of treatment, it is okay to have concurrent treatment. So that means if they want to stop using their substance, alcohol, uh, opiates, or whatever, they can also simultaneously stop using tobacco. As the evidence I showed earlier, they are more likely to maintain sobriety to their other substance if they also quit tobacco use. Some of the challenges in these populations are those with marijuana use sometimes find it a little harder to quit, especially if they are uh, trying to stop using tobacco, but they want to continue smoking marijuana. So it's very, it's highly encouraged to help them to also quit marijuana use. Also, the evidence, uh, some of the research evidence suggests that people with 
alcohol use, it may be better to actually help them stop the alcohol use first, then the tobacco use. But some other studies have said that it's okay to use them, to stop them concurrently. So I would say you take a person-based approach because everybody is unique and work with people where they are. So if they want to stop their substance use first, then tobacco use, we work with them there. But the key is we want to monitor withdrawal symptoms because people with substance use disorders tend to have greater withdrawal symptoms, typically because they use uh, tobacco products at a higher rate as compared to people without substance use disorders. So we need to monitor these as we're helping them in their uh, smoking cessation process. I just wanted to show some medications that can be affected by smoking and smoking cessation. So what this means is that when people with mental illnesses are taking some of these psych antipsychotic, antidepressant, mood stabilizers, anxiolytics, or other medications, if they're smoking, the tar in the cigarettes will interact with some of these medications so that their effectiveness level is greatly reduced in the bloodstream. Okay, so let me repeat that. The tar in the cigarettes reduces the effectiveness of these medications. So we will find that people with some of these disorders like schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, major depressive disorders who, who use tobacco products and who smoke particularly tend to use higher doses of these medications than those who do not smoke. However, when they engage in smoking cessation, when the tar is removed from their bloodstream, then the effective doses of these medications almost go up in their bloodstream if they're maintained on the same doses. So what we might find is we have to reduce their antipsychotic or antidepressant medications because now we need little, we, we don't need as much to get the same effectiveness. And if we don't reduce it, they may experience side effects from having a little too much now that the tar is no longer in their bloodstream. So we do hear patients say, yeah, since I stopped smoking or since I cut down, I've been feeling the side effects of my medication more. And they may attribute that, that smoking cessation is not um, a good thing, but we just have to educate them. Actually, that's a good thing. That means we may need to just lower their medications. Or we find the opposite where now the medications are a little bit more effective than they used to be. So the key is that as we are helping people in smoking cessation, we need to be aware of the antipsychotic medication they're using, and we need to be diligent and vigilant to see if they're experiencing greater side effects or greater uh, effectiveness from these medications. In terms of the medications for smoking cessation, the FDA has seven first-line medications that we can use, including the nicotine replacement products. There are about five, uh, five of them. And then we have bupropion, which is also known as Wellbutrin, also Zyban, and we have Varenicline or Chantix. So in terms of nicotine replacement therapy, nicotine replacement is safe. Um, in terms of medications, other antipsychotic, antidepressants, and so on, you don't have to worry. You can use nicotine replacement products to help smokers quit um, uh, or tobacco users quit, even if they're using other antipsychotic, antidepressant medications. It's safe. The one thing you should be aware of is that they may need combinations. And this is more recommended for people with mental illnesses and substance use disorders. Use combinations of the pharmacotherapy. Use the long-acting patch with a short-acting agent like the gum or lozenge. For people who have uh, intranasal drug use, be cautious when offering the nicotine nasal spray just because they may have uh, problems in terms of their ability to absorb it because of their intranasal use. 
When it comes to bupropion, it's a pretty good choice, especially for those with depressive disorders. The main contraindication is those with a seizure history. So we need to monitor those who have had or who have currently have an alcohol use disorder or eating disorder because these disorders can affect uh, the seizure threshold. Varenicline is the most effective smoking cessation a medication that we know. Uh, people on varenicline are usually two to three times more likely to quit, even as compared to the nicotine patch. And we should overcome our reluctance to prescribe it because earlier on when varenicline was uh, early prescribed, there were cautions that it may have caused greater suicidal ideation, greater uh, psychotic things. But enough research has been done now to the point that the FDA removed the black box label warning regarding varenicline. In other words, it is safe for use for people with mental illnesses and substance use disorders. Of course, as providers, we have to do our due diligence and monitor them, but we should recommend varenicline along with bupropion, along with nicotine replacement therapy for those for whom it is indicated and who it could be safe. The one contraindication is those who have kidney problems or renal failure. So in general, when we're thinking about behavioral treatment approaches, flexibility is key. We need to use a person-centered approach in order to work with patients who want to stop using tobacco. We need to build their confidence and we need to build their skills especially before setting a quit date. These individuals typically have experienced greater failure. So we want to break things down into smaller steps to achieve smaller successes, and this can build their confidence. And we need to make sure that our information is very concrete. So as an example, instead of saying, well, why don't you quit in a week or in two weeks, why don't we take a smoking holiday? Try not quitting for one day. See how you feel. Try replacing your cigarettes instead of five cigarettes a day or 10 cigarettes a day. Why don't you replace five of those with the nicotine gum? So we want to help them experiment with the use of nicotine products, um, coping skills, in order to help them achieve greater success. We may consider individual or group based on the individual. Group programs are very powerful. One of the biggest challenges is that many group programs available are geared towards the general public and may not be quite um, accommodating to people with mental illnesses, especially those with severe mental illnesses. So it's important to be aware of, or even you develop a program that can be geared towards people with mental illnesses. So in conclusion, people living with mental illnesses or tobacco use and substance use disorders do use tobacco at higher rates than the general population. They're disproportionately affected by tobacco-related illness and death. However, tobacco treatment approaches are successful for these populations, but they may need to be tailored and they may need to be more intensive in terms of using combinations of medications or longer durations of treatment. So we behavioral health care providers need to be more aggressive in our offering to treatment for these populations. We need to take it upon ourselves to get more trained and informed in delivering these tobacco treatment, dependence treatment for our populations. So we are here to help enhance the health and the quality of life of those living with mental illnesses by supporting them in tobacco treatment. So here at the BH Well Group, we are very happy to provide uh, training for behavioral health providers who might want to engage their patients and their clients in tobacco treatment. We're happy to come out to your specific setting 
and brainstorm with you based on our expertise about systematic approaches to take to enhance the capacity for tobacco treatment within your specific setting. So there are some resources I just want to make you aware of about how to help individuals with mental illnesses and substance use disorders in their tobacco treatment. Um, we have some resources from New Jersey, some resources from Denver, Colorado, and some of these toolkits both help understand how to make your specific setting, your specific mental health or substance use dis uh, disorder setting, more open to tobacco treatment and uh, tobacco policy interventions as well. Again, here are some other resources just to help us become more informed about tobacco treatment and tobacco use among people with mental illnesses. So I'd be very happy to um, get in contact with me. Again, my name is Zemo Coley. I'm at the University of Kentucky College of Nursing, and I appreciate your time.